you know, when I looked at John's uh, list of target stakeholders and uh, partners, uh, you know, canonically, I can think of three classes of um, scientific challenges that we have to really address to meet their, um, their um, sort of interest or, or to um, or to come to um, a point that we can provide some sci meaningful scientific-based uh, information for their use. Uh, you know, the first group, of course, are, uh, you know, the classical, as I said, um, community that we have been working with, um, that they look to AGMIP to provide guidance on how, what science should be done, uh, should we be, uh, should we be, should we do, and um, how, what kind of analysis assessment we should conduct um, uh, in order to provide um, scientific foundation for assessments, environmental assessments, agricultural assessments, climate assessment. And um, the second um, group um, are those who are really interested in um, the subject of sustainable development and, and doing agricultural in a sustainable way. In, into the future, um, and and the third group uh, could be those who really are interested in understanding the impact of uh, of the change to the agricultural systems, and 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 as a result, how those impacts translates into the markets, economy, trades, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, although they come from different um, perspective, but the common thread, the foundation for all of them, all of those, is the science that we do, the research that we do. Um, in, we had some conversation, side conversations, how do we come to some sort of resolution? Mm -hmm. What ought to be our priorities, scientific priorities for the next decade? Um, in, in a way, in a meaningful way, that really helps meet the interest or the demand or the, the request um, from this three more or less diverse community that is emerging that we are targeting. Uh, so this dialogue is all about hearing the perspective of the panelists um, about um, you know taking a look back at what we have done, how we have done it, and any lessons learned, and what we can do, um, uh, some of what we did in a better way, in a more effective way, to make our results more accessible, more useful, and hopefully more impactful. Um, again, this specific theme relates to the things that we have been doing. And then the second, um, theme and topic that we really would like for, um, for you to comment on. Uh, how do you envision uh, we, you know, AGMIP is evolving toward addressing these two other new categories of um, potential user stakeholders? What is your perspective on um, what their needs are and where we are and what we need to do in order to meet their, um, their needs? So at the end of the day, the objective here is that we take your perspective and uh, factor those into the planning for the AGMIP and the way forward in a way that these perspectives to some extent shape up the, our research priorities, scientific questions that we ask, um, projects, activities that we define, and Equally important, the objective also is, is to engage this target audience in the process so that um, we have some feedback um, from them as we go forward. And you know, one lesson learned from the past is that we, um, at least from the days, early days, we said, well, we really need the time to do this research, to do the science before we could come back and tell you what we can offer. And this sort of serial approach um, hasn't worked quite well because quite often we focus on the scientific topics that we believe they are important and we miss the opportunity to um, factor in the needs of uh, those who we target. 
And at the end, we come somewhat short. Uh, we, uh, we end up short in terms of the utility of the information, the usefulness of the information that we offer, and, uh, and more importantly, uh, the feedback that we may get from them in terms of helping improving those um, products on the way. Uh, so any comments on, on that aspect of what AgMIP should possibly consider doing to make, uh, you know, to, to have a science more um, uh, useful, uh, more impactful to those target communities, as I said, that um, John um, listed on his uh, slide um, this morning. And then, of course, John also commented on the fact that it would be highly desirable to engage some of these stakeholders in knowledge development and knowledge generation. In some sense, it not only provides us with the opportunity to hear their perspective, their feedback, are we on target, are we really developing what they can use, but more importantly, shortens the time to adopting or using or accepting what the knowledge that we generate. And as such, we really kind of don't need to go through that cyclical process that we created you know, er in early days. So that's the, this, so the intent of this, this um, panel is to help, help us reflect on, on some of these issues, um, provide your perspective based on your experience, your knowledge, and um, the needs um, that you're aware of, your, the community that um, you represent, um, so that AgMIP can factor those perspectives into the planning for the way forward. Now, I'll stop here, invite the AgMIP leadership to add any other points that you may have so that we get this discussion that's on the right footing. Go, okay, right. wonderful. So we have really a very nice uh, diverse panel representing the private sector, the regions, and uh, some of our sponsoring agencies. Um, and hopefully we will have a productive discussion for the next 60 minutes. Why don't we start with uh, Jerry, you know. Well, so, um, the uh, Brooklyn Knight job, I think maybe philosophically we're pretty similar in the way we approach it with your comments earlier. So I'm going to kind of wear maybe uh, maybe two hats. One, one is uh, someone who had 29 years working uh, in R&D at Monsanto. So I led up a group that did regulatory, all the health and environmental safety studies of our products and then got global regulatory approvals for them. And then maybe also take, a, take a, uh, an approach coming at it from, a, from a, maybe a policy type of perspective around, you know, what, what do you do about the, your outputs? I mean, so how do you act on what, what, what your outcome is? And, you know, we've, we've kind of talked about, um, and, and I, I would add that, you know, with uh, Monsanto's, you know, acquisition of Climate Corps, you know, we've gotten really into um, to, uh, you know, modeling and data and trying to digitize specific, you know, interventions for a farmer that day, you know, on that farm. Should you go in there or is it too wet? Are you going to impact the soil? On and on. Very, so, so all of my comments are going to have probably a little bit of a hard edge of, so what do, my, what do I decide? What do I do differently as a result of the output of our work here? So the interesting part of the, 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 the nature of extreme weather is that you need to take immediate and extreme action and markets will move up and down and so forth uh, based on extreme activity. But long term uh, climate change may be like the frog being put in the, uh, in the water and then you know the difference between throwing a frog in hot water and it jumps out or putting a frog in cold water and then literally boiling it, I mean gradually. And so the, the immediacy of actions, as we've all talked about, vis-a-vis long-term climate change is, is, is an issue. Because how, what, what do I do differently other than what I'm doing now to de-risk uh, genetic improvement in corn or, um, you know, uh, markets, let's say, you know, you're looking at central, central you know, uh, Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, neither of the two seed markets is sufficiently large enough to come in with large-scale seed production 
And, and as a result, you know, you got to think about uh, local, regional um, harmonization of seed regulate. Uh, what are the kinds of things that you would do locally in order to react to long-term changes? And what I get most worried about, of course, is that most companies, whether you're Bungie and you have 70 economists that are trying to model the relative availability and origination of grain, uh, or infrastructure limitations or what have you, or your uh, pioneer, or your, uh, you know, on and on. You have all your own economic models for what it is that you think is going on. That's all happening, and that's all driving where you, whether you're building a large seed production plant in the Ukraine or in Kenya. So again, all of this stuff, you know, for you're only one translation away from your results to at least in the, you know, in the world that I used to live in, from, you know, how does that inform making the kinds of decisions that, that you need to make? And so it, it becomes very hard-edged, you know, about one conversation away from this room, because you're making... Now, my general belief is that, um, that I don't think it's going to change overnight that companies are going to try to use large data to try and create competitive advantage in their particular crops. The bad news is there are only a few crops that actually get that kind of intention, attention anyway. So if you're soybeans, corn, maybe canola, depending, uh, you know, you've only got a handful of crops that actually get the kind of attention for that type of modeling if you're in the breeder producer range, you know, if you're in the seed industry. If you're in the uptake industry, you'd add wheat and obviously a bunch of others to all that. Uh, but what you do differently as a result of the outcome of this work um, probably doesn't shift a whole lot. Um, the, uh, it's very hard to get a, the head of breeding, I'll just say for Monsanto, to think about um, how to do systematic experimentation on long-term effects of climate change when they're really just trying to figure out how dynamic uh, is their T minus five year corn hybrid in the marketplace. So we've really, that's one of the problems I think we have with the general engagement with the private sector and AGMIP is that it's, we really, you know, we, we need to talk the same vocabulary here, but it's really a different vocabulary there. And your earlier comments, but not wearing a policymaker's hat, it's especially true. So you have an 18 month window now, you know, if you're, in a, uh, you know, if dealing in the US on trying to make a difference vis-a-vis -vis policy short term. And, um, and so you don't really have you know, we've got a president that's, that's, you know, that can say the words climate change in the same sentence, that's good, and is uh, moving to try and do things and so forth. Uh, but that window may or may not be around for, you know, past 18 months. And, you know, time will tell. I'll let others who are more knowledgeable on that. But the, uh, the biggest challenge that we have, and we've talked a lot about it at AGMIP, and, and I've tried to translate and trying to move, is, you know, for companies is to try and convince them that there is a core of knowledge that comes out of these types of activities mm -hmm. that we aren't going to fund, that is Monsanto or Pioneer or Bungie or whatever, they're not going to fund on their own. And that that core is, is actually going to be fundamental in understanding the long-term marketplace and kind of the way to think about investments. So, you know, when I, when I start to think about how to translate things, you can go too far in that and just have it be the flavor of the month, you know, for this month, you know, for this year. And, and you know, nor, uh, what was really fascinating in the, the, the recent UK uh, work that was just published, you know, on the extreme weather was we took an entirely different viewpoint of what are the, what are the extreme impacts on corn and soy and so forth production and use that to inform kind of like bracketing what's possible or what are the boundaries. And it was so not a modeling, ex it became a more modeling exercise, but it started out, how do you figure out what that wobble looks like? Right. So then to then start to do modeling from that. So I, I just would say, um, I'm worried that maybe because we're modelers, we 
we take that, that viewpoint and okay. think the fourth decimal point might be more, more valuable than maybe creating some of the scenarios. So everything I heard this morning is very, very positive to that, Wonderful. including the inclusion of nutrition and so forth. <clears throat> and then I guess, finally, my biggest worry is that you know, crops that are consistently underserved, right. of which there are many, 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 uh, that require uh, just a total upgrade and just being able to meet demand. If you start to layer disease and pests and so a lot of the factors that are just simply not adequately modeled, uh, you know, the, the percentage of reductions of, uh, due to aflatoxin. If I understand it right, I mean, that is a serious risk. Right. So instead of throwing away 10% of the grain, you're throwing away 25% of the grain. And, you know, that is very, very difficult to, to sort through. So I guess my, my constant appeal is one of uh, patience maybe in translating, but you know, don't be afraid to use extreme weather and okay. those types of events to try and get people's attention. And then we need to constantly be thinking about from a breeding and genetic improvement in systems. Uh, it, some of these things are gonna take years to improve the, the germplasm and so forth. How do we do that? How do we raise the uh, alarm bells you know, in an informed manner um, going forward? So. I know it's kind of rambly, but yeah. I, I, I think Great. It's, it's, it's a real challenge. Great. Thank you very much, Jerry. Um, I, what I failed to do is to tell you that you have about five minutes yeah. in order to give us a little bit of time <laughs> for interaction. No, you were, you were okay. You know, just um, Anyway, please stay within five minutes so that we have some time for dialogue yeah. with you. Please. Sure. Yes, please. Um, yeah, so I was asked to uh, give a little bit of perspective of the CGIR in mm -hmm. general. So I'm first of all wondering how many people in the room know the CG system. Is there any needs yeah. for me to <laughs> explain a little bit about it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So everybody knows the CG system? No? Just very, very quick introduction. Very quick. The CG system is actually a consortium of, um, I believe, 15 uh, international research institutions. Mm -hmm. Um, spread over the developing worlds, and they're really doing um, research for development. So um, it's a bit, yeah, in between the sci scientific community and the develop development community mm -hmm. that we're situated. So there are 15 of these institutes. They all have their own mandate. Uh, crops, livestock, uh, everything is there. Economics, um, and uh, over the last years, uh, the whole CG system has been reorganized in what they call CRPs. Not sure how, how many people are aware of the CRPs. Consortium research programs, which are very big interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary uh, research cons programs that, are re that were really meant to make us collaborate more uh, on the systems perspective. And then one of the CRPs that is particularly, well, relevant for, for, for AGMIP is called CCAFs. It's a consortium research program on climate change, agriculture, and food security. So that's exactly, um, well, in the line with what, what AGMIP is, is, is trying to do. Now, um, as I said, the CG system is really, well, in between the academic or scientific mm -hmm. uh, community and the really development community. And over the last years, we've been really, really under pressure to really have impact on the ground and to, to really have outcomes. Uh, and that's, that's no different for CCAFs as a program. So now the big question, of course, is how can we make AGMIP research results really useful to come to these outcomes? And that is really, well, over the last years, we, we've been trying to do that uh, uh, through involvement of stakeholders. And I have to say, CCAFs the, has those networks in place very much. So they have network of stakeholders, and I'm particularly talking about Sub-Saharan Africa now, where I've, most of my experience comes from. So they have these, these networks of stakeholders on the ground. In my opinion, the, the big challenge that we, we, we have uh, in AGMIP is, and, and John already mentioned it this morning several times, is that we, um, up to this point, are not really able to um, provide credible key messages to stakeholders. And that's, of course, for a number of reasons. We, we, we are all very aware that we are, 
well, we still have some challenges with our models, and, and then especially in sub-Saharan Africa, um, where 80% of, of the food is produced by smallholder systems, working on very small uh, plots of land with mixed cropping systems, mixed crop livestock systems, um, with all the complexities uh, in, in, in these systems, and we're simply not at a point that we can model that uh, very credibly, I would say. Um, so as I said, in, in, in most of these cases, we are, we are actually only modeling one crop, a monocrop. And if, if you then would communicate that with, with stakeholders on the ground, let's say a farmer organization, NGO, extension services, or something like that, yeah, they immediately yeah, question, you know, why, why did you only do maize? Why is livestock not, 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 uh, not mm -hmm. in there? So you see that, yeah, the systems are just so complex that we face a lot of uh, challenges in, in, the, in the modeling itself. Uh, so I, I think, um, as I said, there is there's still a very good opportunity to, to really um, well, kind of channel, channel the ECMIP research into CCAFs, but we really have to mm -hmm. make good progress on, 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 on making our modeling exercises uh, more, more credible. Wonderful. Um, yeah, that's great. We'll leave it with that. Right on. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. So at the World Bank, our twin goals are to eliminate poverty and to boost shared prosperity. So we've increasingly recognized that to address these development objectives, we need to factor in climate change into our development programs and activities. And that is why climate smart agriculture is one of our highest priorities. Climate smart agriculture does three things. Increase productivity and nutrition uh, and improves nutrition outcomes. Then it enhances resilience of the agricultural systems. And third, it uh, helps to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. Now, what we have found out is that uh, building evidence and assessment tools is perhaps one of the major uh, issues that we need to tackle to move the agenda of CSA forward. The current evidence base is inadequate for decision making for the desired outcomes, be it improved productivity, improved nutrition outcomes, enhanced resilience, and mitigation that I, I mentioned about. Now, models are coming out quite all right. But if you t take a look at the spatial and temporal uh, skills of these models, mm -hmm. they are not always adequate for national and local level planning. So this is one of the issues that uh, the, this, this research consortium can begin to take a look at. Then apart from that, we are interested in the impacts of climate and weather now in the medium term, as well as in future. There are a lot of uncertainties. So what do we do to reduce these uncertainties, to build in more confidence, as well as to enhance the, uh, the, the, the probability of making a more informed decision using the tools that are available? Then another issue is the need to actually develop problem-oriented approaches to adaptation planning. We need tools for deploying incremental, systemic, as well as transformative adaptation technologies. And those tools have to be location-specific because the impacts, as we all know, of climate change varies from one region to the other. Then, of course, we also need tools for evaluating the adaptation and mitigation potentials of different policies and technologies. Now, when I was at the GRA meeting just last week, uh, I mentioned the fact that to date, the McKinsey, I may be, uh, you, you may correct me if I'm wrong, the McKinsey uh, mit, um, um, uh, mitigation potential curve, yeah, that is the marginal abatement cost curve, is what we have. And up till now, we've not had researchers uh, pick up the challenge of updating this marginal abatement cost curve. Mm -hmm. In fact, we don't even have any for the adaptation component of, uh, of climate change problem. 
So these are some of the issues that we need to take head long so, so that we can actually help farmers, help the, de 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 uh, the development communities, and so on and so forth. So then, talking about the technologies themselves, we found that, that if you would really make impact, then there has to be a, 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 a proper attention to what we call landscape approaches. We cannot take agriculture in isolation. We have to take a look at forestry. You see, mm -hmm. our colleagues in the forestry community, when they are talking about red, the factor in agriculture. So why can't agriculture also factor in forestry and related land uses as we take a look at solving the problems inherent in the agricultural system? Then the issue of integrated models to identify um, uh, barriers to the adoption of climate smart agriculture will be really needed. So we, because we, will, we are interested in what are the economic variables mm -hmm. that are standing in the way of adoption. You see, somebody pre uh, may, uh, published a paper recently and talked about the Holy Cross. That is the inverse relationship between adoption and profitability of climate smart practices. So that is talking about barriers there that we need to really take into consideration to move climate smart agriculture forward in different locales. Now, there's an emerging technology in the area of big data analytics that is taking a look at um, climate, market, prices, and other factors, and use and do applying maybe machine learning algorithms and related um, technologies to actually use this to, de to, to develop tools that mm -hmm. the farmers can use in real time to take agronomic decisions, yeah. marketing decisions, and so on and so forth. So um, these are some of the things that the World Bank is looking mm -hmm. at itself and also collaborating with other partners to ensure that we bring to the table. Then I'll hand by saying that in the area of indicators, we recently developed some indicators for policies, right technologies, as well as results. These are to help guide investment decisions, assess implementation of CSA by different countries, select CSA mm -hmm. technologies for different locales, as well as monitor the CSA results itself. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for going a bit beyond and also talking about a bit of a solution. So we'll come to that, you know, this geospatial information um, based approaches, their limits and their ability. But uh, let's, but your indicators is a good example of what perhaps this community can do uh, to meet your, your needs. Please, yes. Okay, uh, I work uh, uh, at USAID. So uh, I work uh, specifically with the Feed the Future uh, pro uh, uh, initiative, which is a U.S. government initiative that is not just about USAID, but USDA, State Department, uh, and other uh, partners. Uh, but particularly, uh, I would like to talk about, uh, uh, I work in the research division in the Bureau for Food Security. So as a researcher, when I look at <laughs> everything that AGMIP does, it just, uh, it fits a lot very <laughs> well. <laughs> and uh, we, we have... Uh, uh, research projects from what we call innovation lab, Feed the Future Innovation Labs, uh, that have uh, examples on sorghum, on millet, on chickpea, on small-scale irrigation activities. We also have funding through the CGIR, uh, like Africa Rising, the Serial Systems Initiative in South Asia, and so on. So a lot of the things that you're talking about fits a lot uh, on, on what we do. And here, I'm, I'm glad I'm here because I'm learning a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Still to learn a lot. Uh, and as a water advisor, as one of those irrigation advisors, it's nice to hear water playing a prominent role in all of your modeling uh, to nutrition, to crops, and everything. Uh, also, uh, in terms of economics, one of the things we, uh, we talk about, we think about a lot, is sustainable intensification. And to us, uh, it's, it's, it's really important to think about it because we have to think about it from a systems perspective. We have to think about the economics at a household level, to environmental impacts, to gender, socioeconomic activities, and so on. And uh, as you know, uh, two, the two main goals of the Feed the Future uh, initiatives are nutrition and inclusive agricultural growth. So when I see nutrition and food security on the title, <laughs> uh, and also being pre uh, presented here today, and I see it, uh, looking at the calendar, uh, it looks it's going to be presented again. And uh, 
specifically for two projects that I manage, one of them is called the Small Scale Irrigation Lab. They do a lot of modeling, for example, on water through the soil water analysis tool to uh, farm sim, which is an economic and nutrition model. Th these are Texas A&M uh, University people, to uh, Apex, which is a modeling thing that does uh, that includes uh, crops as well mm -hmm. as irrigation technologies. Mm -hmm. And the same thing, the Cereal Systems Initiative in South Asia, which is active in India, Bangladesh, and Nepal, deals a lot with heat stress, <laughs> with uh, uh, and it collaborates with a lot of private sector, including Monsanto. It's a CGIR led, which is implemented by Summit and Erie and all the other folks over here. So in terms of what we would like to see uh, uh, as users, it's kind of, you're already accomplishing a lot of things. But mm -hmm. if I may add, one of the things is, who are your stakeholders here? When you put your analysis here, how can, we make, sh how can you make sure uh, that it's going to reach the small scale farmers? Because Feed the Future fo focuses on small scale the farmers, how we can increase their productivity, their income, and nutrition. So do you, and, uh, and there's been a lot of discussion in terms of het heterogeneity, homogeneity, and scale, and the reality of that is that you have to address all of them, right? Because <laughs> broad scale impacts on climate variability in Southeast Asia will affect it, as well as small scale variability of weather will affect it too. So for example, uh, so it's kind of, a, 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 that kind of focus is, is, is a kind of, how do you make it attributable? How do you make it applicable to the small scale farmers? And who do you reach it out to? It could be, for example, policy makers. Uh, it could be uh, a, a small, the small scale farmers themselves. <laughs> mm -hmm. How could they use your data? Maybe not, maybe yes. It depends on who can understand AdMIP's data, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, the other thing is, uh, 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 in terms of, uh, the quality and validity of the data is that how can you, uh, as modelers, as simulation, simulation, uh, people who do simulations and everything, how can you uh, assure the stakeholders that your models and your data are valid? And that actually requires a lot of interaction between users and uh, uh, you guys. So it means that how, but the thing, the concern here is that about time. <laughs> When can you make it available at that quality and at that uh, 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 standard that is required? So there's kind of an error bar that you have to live with maybe on this thing. And um, so uh, it's kind of, uh, uh, it's a lot of things that you're doing is, is very applicable to a lot of the works that we do. And uh, in the interest of time, I'll just uh, <laughs> leave it uh, as it is now and uh, right. give it to you. <coughs> Steve, thank you very much. Uh, you know, we will come back to this issue of how good is, how, how far should we go to, towards making this product perfect? You know, what is the sort of the marginal value of improvement to the user of the information if the time is of the essence? You know, even assuming that uh, the resources are available to do the research to make it better. But how far down that path should we go if the urgency of having access to what we can do based on what is available today versus waiting for the perfect answer to come along or the best quality product to come along. How far down that path, you know, would be really good to hear from your perspective based on, you know, in the trench decision making, you know, uh, how far down that path should ACME go? Steve, please. So I'm sitting here and I notice that Ken Booty has a cup from the Hickory House ribs. Is that where you went to lunch? Yes, with Jerry. Good choice. <laughs> so when you, when you went in there and, and sat down, they, they probably didn't know whether you wanted the whole rack of ribs or the half rack of ribs or the sandwich. Or, choice. But, but they knew pretty much why you, why you had come in. Uh, at, at the USDA, we're very, we're very heavily customer and stakeholder oriented. And some of our customers and stakeholders feel particularly empowered to give us their advice. <laughs> but the interesting thing is, in contrast to going into the Hickory House ribs place, I suspect, is that when we have a customer or stakeholder come in through the door, we don't necessarily know what they want. And they, and they may want something quite different from the stakeholder or customer that was just in moments before. So we, we may have somebody come in and they say, oh my gosh, the sky is falling, you guys need to put more resources and do more in the area of climate change research. And the next person comes in and says, are you guys nuts? You know, that's just all a bunch of bunk. Quit, quit wasting the taxpayers' money on climate change research. And this idea of customers and stakeholders uh, at a, 
at this level becomes very, very complicated. And, and we, we, we toss off, oh, our customers or our stakeholders, but boy, they are a, they are a diverse mm -hmm. group. Uh, I think what's happening in, in AgMIP, when I look at back from the, at the beginning of AgMIP, what I understood AgMIP to be, it still has that as its core, and that's what this meeting is about. And that is good models, good estimates of uncertainty, uh, bring the, the crop models to the same, same level of uh, 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 utility as the, climate, as the climate models so that they can be hooked up together. And I think AgMIP is making huge strides in that. And that's, that's a big thing that the USDA, as a, as a customer, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you'll allow me that, that that's, that's a great value in terms of planning science, uh, thinking about policy. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, really what we need. Um, but you're also, I think, sense, I, I get a sense that this group is evolving, for sure, uh, with the other two areas that uh, mm -hmm. Gossam mentioned, um, as well as in, my own, in our own programs in USDA. You know, we're, we, almost, we really don't have a climate change national program anymore. We had a climate change national program for years. But what it's, what's happened, it's been absorbed into, the other, in, into other national programs, into the water program, into the systems program, into the soils mm -hmm. program. And, it's, and climate change research has become almost business as usual research. Not that climate change is business as usual, as I'm saying, but what I mean is, is as something that we do research on, it's becoming very much part of the mainstream. It's not segregated off into its own little program and, oh, isn't that cute, you know, and pat it on the head. Um, it's, it's becoming very prominent in, in some of these other programs. And I sense that that's what's happening in AgMIP. So you're asking questions about, yeah. can we use AgMIP to determine, you know, to project what might be a sustainable system? Can we use AgMIP to help set, um, uh, identify where the gaps of information are and use that to help set research agendas? Answer, yes, certainly. Uh, I was really interested in, Adam, what you said, Jean-Francois, you reinforced it, uh, Jessica as well, uh, you know, this, this idea of how, do, how does diet and, and human health and human nutrition link up with these things. You know, that's really starting to occupy a lot of conversation in USDA. So as I think you're moving in the directions that we're seeing the complexity of the science for all of this going anyway. And it, at the same time, as it becomes more complex, it becomes more of the sustained effort that we have in, in, in doing this kind of science. So I would say, on the one hand, I feel like, oh gosh, I wish AgMIP would stay focused on those assessments because, man, we really need those. But at the same time, I see the value in having it evolve and, and get into these other things because that's where the priorities are going broadly as well. So I guess what I, my, in terms of what I, want, what I want out of this is I want those assessments, but, but, I, but I also see tremendous value in these other things and, and uh, addressing the incredible diversity of customers and stakeholders that we're all facing. Thank you, Steve. Uh, you also introduced the theme that we should definitely come back to because what has really worked for AgMIP is identifying the big ticket science issues that no one organization, no one country by itself can really tackle. So keeping true to those big ticket items, complex issues that really requires the efforts of multi multiple institutions, multiple countries to tackle them is, is key to our sort of success um, on the way forward. And um, so it goes back to the earlier questions posed by some of the panelists, you know, how far down this path should we go spatially all the way from global to the local to regional to the national level? We have to be mindful of that. We can't, honestly, we cannot do it all. But where can we do the most, have the greatest impact on these very complex issues that you are all identifying as we think about the next decade. Kathy, please. So NASA has a very different kind of tension. Um, the, the NASA tension is more uh, one between engineers who like to build things <laughs> and scientists who like to understand things. And there's a lot of headbutting about pie in the sky, we want to observe everything about the Earth, but oh no, you'll never get it off the ground because that instrument needs to be the size of a building, right? So, so we have a little bit different kind of attention. Um, and, and that said, as a, as a sort of a, uh, 
a, a MIP person from day one. I was involved with VMAP and CMIP and all kinds of MIP activities. I've, I've never been directly involved with Ag MIP throughout my career, but I have watched it evolve. And especially this morning, it was quite um, eye-opening to see some of the directions that Ag MIP is going into the, the course of um, understanding human system needs and the responsibilities of the scientific communities towards that. And that said, NASA is also evolving somewhat in that degree. I'm here for Brad Dorn, who leads um, the applied sciences um, uh, area for within the Earth Science Division. And you know, so NASA is evolving into more of a, an applied ap you know, applications perspective from biodiversity to ecological forecasting, as well as the most recent call um, and selection in the terrestrial ecology program, which is the Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment, where that call specifically called for proposals that would investigate the vulnerability and resilience of ecosystems and societies to environmental change. And I say that with an emphasis on environmental because it's not all about climate. Um, there are a lot of aspects, say, about climate change that may improve the growing season in the high latitudes, but they don't have the soils. Um, they don't have the organic matter, so there's going to need to be a lot of mitigation to those systems if you want to produce up there. So, and that's where AgMIP can help, you know, in many ways, because they do have sort of that process level understanding inherent in many of those models. So, I was quite enthused about the selection for above. Um, I had PIs calling me almost every day saying, do you really want to talk studies about wildlife vulnerability and societal res resilience to environmental change? And I said, yes, that's, that's exactly hallmarked. And we have a great selection um, from wildlife, uh, doll sheep uh, studies through to, um, uh, Inuit um, and, and, and tribal concerns for environmental change, all the way through to the very much more classic carbon cycle, uh, permafrost, and hydrology question. So it's, it's, it's gonna be, above is just getting started. The first science team meeting is in a couple of weeks and the field campaign kicks off next year in Alaska and to somewhat in the Northern Territories. So that said, um, there, it's also an exciting time for NASA and for AGMIP and I really see an opportunity in this dialogue between the decision making community and the modeling community to start identifying what are the kinds of observations that might be necessary. Um, we're not in a mission to planet Earth mode where we have giant missions evolving, but we've been more directed towards smaller, more cost efficient, perhaps high risk missions, the Earth Venture mission and responding to decadal <coughs> survey. So some of those, some of the new sensors and missions that have just been launched, for instance, is the um, Orbital Carbon Observatory that just came up, um, went up, uh, I think in January. Now, it may, it may be looking at profiles of CO2 in the atmosphere, but there's also something new that's coming out of that radiometer, and that's um, solar-induced fluorescence. And that's measure of solar, of, of fluorescent activity by photosynthesis in the plants. So it's coarsely resolved, but it's giving, an, giving us a sense at least of um, the, the cycle of plant activity over the course of the year. And this, there's gonna be a new press release coming out on that very soon um, with the new data. There's the new global, um, precipitation monitoring that's taken over for trim. So we're looking at precipitation now, much better improved resolution. There's the Landsat, most of you are familiar with land cover change through the um, Sustainable Land Initiative and Landsat data. And the Soil Moisture Active Passive or SMAP uh, mission, which was just recently launched. And as many of you know, the radar power failure, power supply has failed, but that doesn't mean that we're not getting um, good soil moisture and freeze thaw information. And if you think back even 10 years ago, 40 kilometer data would have been awesome. Because we're not able to get four kilometer data, we, we still have good science coming out of that mission. In the future, we've got some, um, some planned activities that are gonna be launched on board, both the um, International Space Station, which involves a collaboration with uh, many other international uh, space agencies, JAXA, uh, the European Space Agency, and a, and a host of others. Um, JEDI, which is going to be um, a space-based lighter looking at canopy architecture. Um, another one, EcoStress, which is being uh, developed out at JPL. And this will be very interesting for um, the AgMIP community to keep um, their eyes on, mm -hmm. is looking at hyperspectral um, radiometer information on plant ecophysiological stress. So that will be a really interesting um, uh, mission to come on board. In addition, um, the TEMPO, which is looking at um, Oh, I forget what TEMPO stands for. I wrote it down somewhere. Tropospheric um, emissions and uh, monitoring pollution. 
So it's going to be looking at NO2, sulfur di SO2, ozone, and other aerosols and precursors in the atmosphere at hourly basis. Now, now that is going to be, un unfortunately, it's not global. It'll go from, say, Mexico all the way through to the high latitudes. But it'll start giving us an idea on these hourly um, changes. And it's not necessarily actually monitoring or taking advantage of observing human decision-making processes, but the human decision-making processes, whether it's electric plug-in vehicles all the way through to koi, uh, soybean or corn production, the amount of, um, of, uh, of uh, uh, fossil fuel emissions and others from the actual you know, production of crops, that'll be very useful to this community as well. Um, another instrument that's being planned that currently has an airborne capability is the, um, the Surface Water Ocean Topography Mission, the SWAT mission, which is going to go mm -hmm. up around 2018, 2020, and that's going to be looking at the altimetry of streams. Mm -hmm. From that, understanding mm -hmm. the depth and the breadth and everything, we'll be able to get stream velocity and get a handle on where and, and, and how much the streams are drying up. Grace follow-on, which is a, um, uh, mm -hmm. a gravity measure, is right now, well, the GRACE follow-on is under development, but GRACE can give us some idea of subsidence. It was mentioned this morning about mm -hmm. groundwater withdrawals. Many of the models don't, uh, we don't really know how much water is in the groundwater, right? So we, we do try to capture it in a coarse way, but there are some really nice um, data c coming on board from some of the GRACE uh, uh, um, results that are really showing subsidence, especially in the uh, Central Valley. We can really see it at centimeters. Um, I think there's some, some, JPL has something up online that from 2007 to 2012, you, that you can see that it's the Central Valley have subsided up to 15 <coughs> centimeters. So we can really start to take a, get a handle on water withdrawals. And, and there's a host of others from atmosphere to ecosystems. But there's, there's a real opportunity now at NASA for really observing the Earth system from a much more holistic perspective, especially as we go into the more applied and um, ecosystem vulnerability and, and resilience arenas. So I really look forward to mm -hmm. the development of this workshop and possibly future workshops that can start bringing those communities together much more closely. Great, <clears throat> thank you very much. You have heard it uh, from, uh, you have heard the perspective of the, our sponsors, the stakeholders, all the way from those who depend on our um, science to those who enable or fund our research activities. It's really exciting to see that the capabilities are coming along that are consistent with the needs of the research community. So I'll turn it over to you to ask any question you may have from the panelists. Uh, yes, Alex? That's another burning question, maybe get the conversation going. So in the, one of the early slides today when we were saying why are we doing a coordinated global and regional assessment, one of the concerns was this idea that right now there's this popcorn of different studies with different assumptions and scenarios and models. And I'm wondering if you've seen that and whether you see that as a tenable way to continue going forward or whether you think that there's an opportunity there to bring a little bit more consistency and, and whether there'll be a benefit to that in particular. Anybody? ventures to answer that question. <clears throat> what can AGMIP community do to help facilitate the greater coordination among these diverse group of um, sort of uh, scientific efforts that are really have well intention but quite often unfortunately not uh, done in, a, in a, a rigorous manner and that create more confusion than actually helping answer the question. So, is the role for ACMIP to play in coordinating those efforts, as, especially as we go to these regions and diversity of the type of problems that we look at? Anybody? Steve? <laughs> well, I don't know that ACMIP has any particular route for coordinating other than people to the, to the extent that participants allow it to coordinate. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's kind of a, a voluntary thing. Uh, one of the one of the values in 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 doing this effort is the is the intercomparison part, mm -hmm. and I think to the extent that AgMIP can bring all these various modelers together, some some models are are good and some are better than others, or whatever that saying goes. But um, uh, some how does that work? All model all, all, some are useful. Yeah, that's what I wanted. Thank you. Um, you know, to the extent that you can bring those people into the fold to evaluate those and, and make decisions about which ones seem to have something to contribute and become part of that intercomparison uh, activity, which is 
the way that you're getting it at the model uh, at the uncertainties. Um, I think I, I guess I see that as having value, and I wouldn't want to squelch it. Um, but it do, they do need to be evaluated, and, and they, if you're going to if you're going to make use of them, they need to be uh, you know evaluated and make make sure that they're uh, if they're if they're at least somewhat reliable, and if not com not as reliable as you want, know what the limitations are. But I think that's part of the overall part of the overall strength of what of what you're doing is looking at, at these various uh, various models and various sources and and comparing comparing them. Yes, John. Uh, yes, I mean, one of the objectives of this workshop is to identify questions, that we, the most important questions. And, and as we look at, at your panel, I wondered if you thought any about what, what are the questions that you think we might add to our list that would help better engage the user community, some of the issues that you, you dealt with, uh, all of you dealt with some of the issues of, of dealing with those. What, what are the questions that you think might contribute? <coughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, specifically. Yeah, I was what questions I would ask, and then yeah. I, I don't have. Well, actually. you know, I mean, yeah. the attributes that yeah. you're looking for is it timeliness? Is it accuracy? Yeah. Is it really, yeah. um, you know, um, what what is it that you're looking for, and to what extent the time scale? Yeah, time. Yeah. yeah. Right. Wow. Well, uh, I think one of the one of the questions that you need to ask yourself, I should say, mm. <laughs> is <laughs> what do policymakers need in terms of uh, what, what can AgMIP do to help policymakers make a decision? Uh, I will give you a specific example, for example. Uh, uh, the Serial Systems Initiative in South Asia, I have to talk about that because I am the activity manager for it, so I can <laughs> go back to my what I know. Uh, is that they, uh, the CIMIT, ERI, and all the other CJR centers who are leading the project in collaboration with the KBKs, which are the research centers in India and other people, actually through many years of study convinced, the, uh, you know, not convinced, but, you know, decided with the Bihari government in India that if planting dates, if they can plant, start planting 15 days earlier, then productivity could be improved. improved. But that's not just about choosing a planting date. It has to be a systems perspective about, uh, uh, for example, zero, zero tillage technology, better breed of uh, wheat and rice. So it includes all the crop models as well as water availability, when you plant it, what kind of mechanization you use, and that kind of, uh, so that's kind of a question of, if you're a policy maker, that's one of the things that maybe you can, you can start thinking because this is a national agricultural, you know, uh, federal, uh, the federal system of Bihar that can do that. And another, and this is kind of, I went to Ethiopia recently to look at the small scale irrigation lab, which I manage. And we looked at their production, the first production, and actually their crops went away, even though they had all the good crop, good fertilizer, supposedly good irrigation system, but the, the failures are multiple, of course, but one of the most failures is that when they should start planting, because they planted it at a season when it was too dry, so the crops died. So <laughs> it's something that how can your climate models uh, include with the uh, include those kind of scenarios for policy policymakers? That's kind of a uh, and and that also have to be uh, uh, included with gender, uh, nutrition, what kind of income inputs for the uh, for example uh, the the tomato and other variety that they had was too expensive. So how do you can they make it cost effective? Or if they buy it at a higher price, how much is their productivity that can make it higher? So these kind of questions are what I'm thinking in my head at the moment since I've been put on the spot. <laughs> Jerry, you wanted to say. You know, so uh, <laughs> we had this discussion actually, I think the first time I really started to kind of understand the difference almost in culture between models of models, you know, groups of models, almost like meteorology and so forth, versus the world that I come from, which is more uh, just classic risk assessment in this instance, you know, for products and human health and all that. Because, you know, to the extent you can take, take something down to a probability of a particular risk or, or even just qualitatively describe the nature of the risk. So, um, you know, two and a half degrees Fahrenheit, five degrees Fahrenheit, at what stage does that actually, in effect, become 
multi-season crop failure if we don't change genetics and practices. I mean, you know, some of these you know better, much better than I, but that's, you, to take it and convert it into the probability of not having food not, and, and so forth. So uh, I'm just going to make a few statements and, you know, please don't throw anything at me, but I, I would, and as someone who was funded NIH grants for a long time, I think ag is underfunded in relationship to, let's say, NIH. They had a very, very specific strategy. They got, ex you know, very, very, you know, were extremely talented in communication and have been pounding away and making progress in some fronts for quite some time. If you look at the agricultural challenges, I think part of it is, is because we made significant, uh, my grandfather's made and my father's and made significant progress, there wasn't as much of a pressure, but if you believe um, you know, even just basics on, on what AgMIP has been saying, and many of you in the room have been saying, we're simply not investing enough in agriculture in order to make a response to that. And to Adam's point, if you want to be eating roughly what your culture has been eating, cassava or white maize, or, you know, some, in some places, it, you, you just have a hard time imagining 50 years forward that those cultural practices are not only, they're maybe on a holiday and only to the rich. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very, so the urgency, and you think about how rapidly it takes, you know, how long it takes to, to make genetic improvements. And, you know, some of the things you're doing at USAID and all that to try and create step changes and CG system. But there's the level of urgency vis-a-vis -vis the, the long-term mm -hmm. risk as well as the extreme weather risk. It's just, yeah, I just don't see the level of urgency around it. Mm -hmm. And so companies go away and they make their products and so forth and they go do that and they, you know, compete and they make, they're trying to have really high yielding and good disease resistance incrementally for the next year and maybe their five-year pipeline. But that's about as far off unless you're really forward thinking. I think one of the things that Ag MIP could do back to the questions so, as you know, we're, uh, Dave Gustafson at ILSI, and you know, we've spent a bunch of time talking about and act, trying to act on um, data, you know, open data. And, you know, you just made a, a really great list of new data that will become available. Um, whether you call it, I, I, I've been president of ILSI, which is this kind of a large group of private sector, public sector, and, uh, and uh, academic um, scientists that, that kind of come together in the area of nutrition and toxicology and risk assessment, et cetera. And we've had difficulty, Jim's been on our research foundation board, kind of selling why, you know, to the, to the private sector, why, um, why act on this. And private sector is very nervous about the data they own and very nervous about the proprietary value of that data. So the idea of pre-competitive data and post-competitive data in many ways is really what you can work on in those types of an environment like ILSI. So you're trying to create the collective analysis. Mm -hmm. And to me, that, that is, we, we have to come up with a way that either these types of data so that their own internal scientists can analyze it, and there are very few, I might add, compared to the horsepower in this room, um, but the pre- or post-competitive analysis that permits them to make decisions on investments and then in the public arena, similarly, back to your point on policymakers. So um, if you want me to go away and raise more money for ag research, what's my five top bullet points? And I've seen Cynthia do it at the Chicago Council mm -hmm. where, you know, she took all the three significant de decimals and, two de and just said, here's what's happening. And it made an impact in that conversation. Um, and we almost need to take our modeling, you know, what we do in this room in a way, and take it off and try to decode it from the context of what is going to happen if we don't uh, act. And then the key is, is that we've, this group really can't actually change products in the market that easily. We've got to be able to make it so that folks who make those decisions actually go, wow, 
okay, I need to, I need to make a modification. Or, uh, and extreme weather and some of the, the, the resiliency questions, in my opinion, end up being a really good test to policymakers to, you know, to see whether they'll act on any of this. Yeah, uh, there seems to, uh, you know, that a theme is emerging here is that, you know, a risk-based type scenarios or analyses that on one hand has its roots in the actual, you know, backcasting observation that you can take advantage of the observations, but also forward-looking that can t take full advantage of the models seems to be emerging out of this that will really provide the venue for communicating the the, the, the sort of the benefit of the science to the private sector, to the development community. So at least I'm just um, observing that this theme seems to be coming back. Uh, Jean-Francois mentioned it is in the morning. John mentioned it, you know, this, this theme coming back time and again that really goes beyond the sort of this, the classical assessment that you do for IPCC type Community. Sorry, so, sorry. Can I can I just add a few points? Uh, let me see oh. a question. Yes. Well, I wanted, I wanted to build on your last comment actually. Yeah. So, uh, we'll come. And, and this is maybe I should start by saying I place a tremendous value on the IPCC. If I were to listen to some of the comments from this morning, you know, I would infer that the AGNIP leadership right now views the IPCC as one of its primary stakeholders. Yes. So that you're thinking right. about your near-term planning very much right. with IPCC's timeline in mind. So my question to the panel of users is, how much does it matter to you if AgMIP's products make it into AR6 in whatever form that takes? Or is that really not very important? We, you know, while you ruminate, so you wanted to make a comment with respect to the previous. Yeah, yeah, to the, be, to the previous one. Yeah, okay. you were asking of what uh, could be of interest. Now, access to timely, cost-effective information can really make a lot of difference as far as resilience is concerned. Yeah. And uh, I brought some papers to. Uh, there to, 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 to give an example of what we found out in Ethiopia as well as Kenya concerning the development of agro-weather tools. Right. I mean, East Africa is a place where the frequency of field seasons has increased tremendously. And um, what agro-weather tools did was to reduce the impact of field seasons in the life of the farmers. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and there are so many of these tools coming up, and AgMIP can add a lot of value to some of these issues. For instance, look at Kabi. Kabi has produced mm -hmm. what we call plant-wise. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that needs include, to be included in that is um, to match those um, recommendations with um, weather variabilities or weather factors that if the weather is so so and so this and these are the technologies that needs to that that we need to build upon so and um, i must also mention that uh, at the other hand of the users we are interested in technologies that you can deploy to the field immediately not the technologies that we are trying to uh, establish the proof of concept so Technologies that can be deployed to the to the field, handed over to farmers immediately, will make a lot of difference. And agro weather tools help to identify such and build on those. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'm mindful of the fact that we are at ten uh, at three eleven. We started a bit late. Um, we're cutting into our coffee time, but it's such a really great discussion. I you know hate to sh cut it short. Any one of you? care to comment on the question about the, how far AGMIP should go vis-a-vis -vis the IPCC? So I think for many agencies, not just for NASA, but publications and, mm -hmm. and, and citations in the IPCC are our metric of success. Um, I just went through my first, I'm sure Goss was quite mm -hmm. familiar with the GIPRA. I don't know <laughs> if you had to be involved with this. But we have to report to Congress every year on highlights, and we depend on our researchers to provide us with the publications. Um, and 
if we were comprehensive just for the focus area, the carbon cycle and ecosystems alone, it would be a 700 page document every year. We have to distill it down and distill it down and distill it down. That said, Congress looks at these reports, these GIPRA reports every year. So if something comes out you know, into IPCC as being cited from NASA relevant work, that really helps us get our funding and think about what kinds of new um, missions we need to we need to be thinking strategizing for the future so it's very important i didn't realize how important publications were at on this side of the table if you if you will until just a few months ago and and the other thing i, I think one of the themes that i've heard this morning and others is that the changes in the growing season and when to plant and these sorts of things are really really key for farmers and, and, and regional activities to really understand how to improve their yields and provide food security. And I think to throw that back to the AgMIP community, really understanding the consequences of a changing growing season, whether if you're planting earlier in the year, and let's say your growing season is extended by 15 days, are you gonna have enough water to sustain that crop an additional 15 days? Or do you have enough of a water balance in your models to account for the increased evapotranspiration coming out of the soils and off the plants, similarly depleting the water supply? Um, and if you have not enough water and it's warm longer, are you going to be able to sustain, you know, your yield? So, so I think that's something that, that, you know, these issues that are clearly coming from CG, from World Bank, from yeah. USAID, and even and Monsanto, we don't, you know, so NASA doesn't do genetics, but, um, but it, it's really important for you, for the modeling community, to think about what the consequences of some of these demands are. And, you know, increased growing season does not necessarily translate directly to higher yield. It, it translates into more things to think about, which kind of is a good thing, you know, for us as scientists, yeah. but it's also a good thing for us to help you. So my take on this is that really, given that AGMIP is being looked at as the experts in the field of agriculture, to a large extent, we shape that part of the IPCC's agenda. It's not as if we follow blindly what they need. We really shape up the agenda for what matters to the agri agricultural community that IPCC should focus on. So the point I'm making is that what we decide to do versus what IPCC expects from us is, are not mutually exclusive. You know, of course, there's some degree of give and take, but to a large extent, we really shape the agenda on agriculture for IPCC. And here's a chance for us to introduce this risk-based analysis that everybody is talking about. Alex. And Jim, yeah, Jim and Alex. Uh, yeah. I was going to follow up on the question that. Uh, got your name, sorry. No, it's fine. No, that's fine. Uh, in, in terms of IPCC, and you know what we've heard here today have been the risk assessment, the climate smart agriculture, the extreme events, and you know I, I'm wondering whether we shouldn't consider something that would be a little bit different than the typical long-term climate change assessments, right. but, but include a continuum right. between now and the yeah. next five years, the next yeah. 10 years, right. and the next 50 years, Absolutely. so that we can get in these risks right. and right. G by E by M that your right. ARS is working on, right. to, to really bring that to bear on this right. risk, risk assessment. Absolutely. We talked about it a little bit at, in the context of the extremes that are more short-term in terms of, and that's where the economic community also has some exciting research ahead to I do in so. yeah, bringing I along. I think you could bring in you know, folks that have um, really studied the whole area of just systems resilience, but do it from the context specifically of agriculture. So to your point on climate smart agriculture, yeah. if you start to think about there are some fundamental policies and potentially some investments that could be done that could significantly improve resilience and, and um, that, so by going with the shorter time frame, it permits you to create dialogues on that space while at the same time, you know, not losing a beat on, you know, this is a long term and we don't really have the answer. I mean, if disease, you know, if, if we, 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 we already are at the point of, you know, 0.1 or 0.4% yield gains, you know, per annum on many, many crops that the world, you know, smallholders rely on. And, you know, that's, that's, for several, it's going to not get any better unless we do a lot, you know, do things, many things differently. Right. So I, I think it permits you then to maybe even bring in some other players 
which I would argue probably helps you in the narrative part of the IPCC part. So Alex, yeah, go ahead. The way the way that the CMIP and even IPCC, you could argue, works is that there are kind of leapfrogging phases. There's a developmental phase, and then there's an assessment phase. And I want to just make clear in the conversations this week, we are talking about an assessment, but it is not going to stop agnip development in other areas. Um, so many of the things that the panel brought up continue to be major research areas that we want to focus on, and many of them are done within the building blocks that we're talking about here. But at the same time, if we just have a continual development and never stop and assess where we are and put those markers down, uh, we're going to end up selling ourselves short. Can I make just a follow-on to that, which is also, I think what we're talking about is having uh, also leapfrogging in assessment. Let's design, right. I think that's what we're really talking about, how can we design an assessment that is also pushing, yeah. for the, yes. really <laughs> pushing the whole thing forward. Right. Not doing same old, same, same old, old kind exactly. of IPCC yeah. approach. Exactly. Any other questions? Your, you know, your question is between us and coffee. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, I, it's it seems useful for me. So I'll just throw this out there to distinguish. I mean, some of the conversation is about the tension on what topics to focus on, or that should be the focus of an assessment. Whether that's short-term, urgent issues facing the agricultural system, longer-term climate impacts, things like that. The second one is on uh, where in the continuum between basic science, applied science, and practice um, should agmit efforts uh, trend uh, over time. And I, I think it's just useful to distinguish those. From my point of view on you know, admitted bias on the sort of longer-term scenario-based climate impact assessment, there's no replacement for AGMIP. You take AGMIP away, there's nothing there. On the practice part of the continuum, um, we have a panel full of organizations that already do it. So I'm sure that there are gr greater needs in this area, and it would be great if AGMIP can help there. But when I look at it and say, well, if AGMIP sort of, you know, goes down the road of kind of climate services and working directly with farmers in the field and so on. We, I know this is not all or nothing, but still, at least in relative terms, we lose, uh, you know, a huge um, chunk of, of the uh, agricultural research um, contribution, uh, particularly to, to the climate area. Um, so that's sort of, I don't know if that's accurate, but it's my two cents on where I came out. In this I, I, I think, uh, Brian, uh, you know, you got the message that clearly there is a demand or need for AGMIP type information by this group of users. But I didn't hear that they are going so far as saying that you have to really get this, get this all the way down to the, you know, to the final stop. But what we are hearing is that the type of assessment that we do for IPCC, we've been doing for IPCC, does not quite meet the type of information that this type of analysis these other organizations are doing. For example, this continuum of uh, the sort of the, the time continuum uh, because of the impact of uh, extremes and shocks to the system that creates all kinds of market volatility and uh, you know exodus in terms of population, all those. They are all have their roots in food systems and they are environmental in nature, but the very long-term centennial time scale assessments that we are doing do not meet the type of need that these communities are. So it's just, it's just a matter of rethinking our time scales of our assessments. As I said, it's not all for all or nothing. It's just creating that continuum. We had the same cons com uh, conversation in 2008 within the CMIP, right? Back then, everything was global. It was great commotions about whether we should go regional or not, right? right I think and we, we decided to go. So this is the same type of conversation we were having here is that really there is this urgent need for science-based information that goes beyond these long-term, long cycle assessments if we are going to meet the needs of 
these other communities that are doing the final analysis. So that, those are my two cents. Yeah. I'll just add that you know when we were talking about AR5, I'll never forget being up at Breckenridge with Jerry Neal and Dave Schimmel, and we were trying to, to figure out how to design the next series of experiments for SEMAs, right? And so it's clear that the 1%, the 3% runs are the, are the mm -hmm. meat and potatoes of the CMIP, you mm -hmm. know, um, community. And that is, those are the standard runs they've done all the time that they can base the development of their models on. Carbon cycle was clearly coming into the forefront, so that was the gist of that 2005 AGCI that Jerry mm -hmm. and I were at. But that said, you know, we were all sitting there and just sort of scratching our heads because it was clear that the policy community and you know, was making more and more demands on the climate modelers that didn't have the resources or the wherewithal to do that sort of decadal prediction. And that's where this whole decadal prediction exercise was born, was this knowledge of a need that the climate modeling community needed to be more relevant to the policy community, and the seasonal interannual prediction community needed to also sort of stretch its boundaries right. a little bit. So as was mentioned earlier this morning, decadal prediction was basically fell on its face, right? Mm -hmm. Because those two communities talked together for the first time, they realized what their limitations were, but they, they're still moving forward. There were some successes and they're building on those successes for AR6. So, so I, don't, I don't think, as Gossam said, it's an all for one. I, I believe that AGMIP truly, through its evolution, ha AG is the glue, really, that gives you guys this, this ability to really think about how do we model these systems. And now the evolution and the new questions into policy relevance and providing aid for World Bank, USAID, and others is, is that just sort of next step in evolution. So I don't see, I see the opportunity for the AG modeling community to really help shape whatever working group two or three communities come up with and possibly even working group one. It all depends on how the bureau and the panel shakes out. Jim, following that, exactly, I mean, I was sensing, based on this the fact that uh, CML 5 had some on the decadal climate prediction, I'm wondering if there isn't a, a transition there to start looking more and more at the shorter yeah. time frames as well as the longer ones. Yeah. And if so, wouldn't we have scenarios that we could use in the shorter time period as well as the longer <coughs> time period to, to make this uh, maybe a next generation of, uh, of, of assessments? Absolutely. And out of those discussions really came four classes of experiments and a concept of seamless pre prediction across time scales that goes all the way from seasonal to sub-seasonal to decadal to centennial time scale, yeah. recognizing that there's a lot of research to be done. That's what really captured the interest of the agencies like NASA, NSF, DOE, and others to invest, recognizing that decadal predictability was really not quite there. And they said, well, we pick it up as, as a priority area to invest to make greater progress. So, that is the opportunity that I see for us to highlight that convinces Kathy to take the message back to NASA and Steve to take back to AR, saying that here are the exciting research that needs to be done to enable these kind of capabilities that you know, the, the community at large is asking. So that's the research part of it. And that would link in better with the, with the World Bank, with the exactly. USAID, with the private right. sector. Right. So, uh, and similarly, yeah. it's like Dominique said earlier this morning, it's horses for courses, right? It's like not, the climate models results aren't necessarily relevant or even useful for World Bank or USAID. But some of the new activities are, and, but you know, some of the longer term planning projections, 50 to 100 years, could be useful. So you have to really think about what are the objectives, and AGMIP has the breadth and the scope to really start thinking across these scales in a meaningful way. So it, it's just a sort of a new, I see it as a possibility for some new directions. Mm -hmm. So I hope this has triggered sufficient question and create sufficient dialogue. That's the whole purpose of this session, <laughs> that while we are here together this week to really discuss some of these topics and, you know, agree or disagree, and if we agree, identify what AGMIP should be doing, and, and then for the next decade, on behalf of the community, and hopefully these topics are exciting enough that convince the community of volunteers, as many of you have said, to rally behind them. So with that, uh, if you allow me to stop us here and go have a cup of coffee and continue this conversation over coffee. Yeah.